Thank you. What a lot of people. I mean, I hadn't, uh, I had, of course, I, I, I knew the RSA was a, um, got lots of members and been revived under uh, Matthew's leadership, but hadn't expected this. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I was just listening to John Hutton on uh, uh, my namesake, but no other relation, although apparently if you do share the same surname, um, somewhere back, um, if we, our genomes will overlap in some way. Anyway, um, I was listening to John Hutton on the radio this morning saying that actually uh, how unfair it was that the um, burden of uh, increased longevity, which has made public sector pensions a great deal more expensive, was being wholly borne by the taxpayer and that the that at least some of that extra cost should be borne by those in receipt of the pension because it wouldn't be fair. And that only, only the day earlier, um, David Cameron has said that those with broader shoulders, um, those who you know, pay high rate tax, should have their child benefit withdrawn to raise a billion pounds um, to fund uh, in the uh, this unified um, welfare credit uh, that uh, <coughs> Ian Duncan Smith is going to introduce um, to permit people who move from benefit into work to be able to retain part of their benefit to make work worthwhile. So if you get £10,000 of benefits and there's a minimum wage job at £12,000 after tax, and national insurance is worth ten and a half or £10,000, you can be able to move from benefit, to take that minimum wage job, and actually retain maybe £2,000, the £10,000 of benefit that you were receiving, and that makes it worthwhile to do. And this was the, uh, those with broader shoulders were going to um, uh, pay to give opportunity to those at the bottom, uh, because it was only fair. Uh, you'll the Labour Party fought the last election on fairness. Um, so did Nick Clegg. He said he wanted to hardwire fairness into Britain's DNA. And it is the coalition's leitmotif. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about this. I mean, what do we mean by fairness? Um, uh, uh, to what extent is it a kind of left? Um, I mean, both, everyone on the left thinks that fairness, and because it comes with notions of justice, social justice, and equality um, is naturally a liberal left idea. Uh, but one of the points I try to make in the book, um, when you think very hard about it, is that um, that is just not the case. Um, there's, of course, an egalitarian dimension to fairness. There's also a libertarian dimension to fairness. And actually, all of us in different times of our lives have probably been both libertarian and egalitarian about how we consider fairness. And there's also the role of luck. Is quite, because um, uh, everyone in the room knows that luck plays an enormous part in your life, wherever you're born in the income distribution. Um, uh, do you make your own luck? Can you say with um, it was Gary Player who famously said, um, you know, the more I practice, um, the luckier I seem to get. Um, I, you can work on your talents uh, that you were born with, and um, some work harder than others on their talents, and then make their own luck, <coughs> what moral philosophers call option luck. And then there's brute luck. Uh, what did anyone do to be born to um, the parents that are now sending them to one of the top private schools? or can expect to inherit some millions when their parents or grandparents die. They did nothing. They are the undeserving rich. And so you, when you start thinking, I mean, uh, this notion of the deserving and the undeserving poor, John Rawls, when he wrote Theory of Justice, <coughs> wanted to argue, and does argue, that actually, um, if you are in the circumstance of being in the very bottom of the, income, at the, bottom of the pile, it, your circumstances are entirely uh, bad luck. It's just you, have, you are unlucky to be born into that family, in that household, in that neighborhood. And really, the layer upon layer upon layer of disadvantage makes it close to impossible, however hard you try to be deserving, 
um, to get out of that situation. There is no such thing in a Rawlsian world as the undeserving poor. And I'm going to argue that actually um, this is the Rawls is 90% right. But there, is a, there are circumstances in which you can talk about, I think, the deserving and the undeserving poor. And you can talk about the deserving and the undeserving rich. And it's really about this brute luck and option luck. <clears throat> and, I, and I think fairness is such a, um, although people say it's kind of an anemic idea, um, or it's a bit like apple pie and motherhood, an idea which um, you know, we all know intrinsically you know, what's fair. Actually, when you start to push a bit, um, what does it mean? I mean, what does a two-year-old mean tugging at his, her mother's skirts or trousers um, when uh, he, she says, it's not fair, Mum. You've given more chocolate cake to Harry. Why? It's just not fair. What is the justice in that? And it's actually what we now know from um, uh, the great the number of great experiments made by kind of behavioral psychologists and indeed moral philosophers that um, human beings are born with not only an innate capacity to learn a language, but an innate capacity to link intention to outcome. You know um, within seconds of arriving on the planet that there is a relationship between um, the intentions that you formulate and the outcomes. And we don't know yet, but we think that um, you hold that, um, uh, an embedded notion of proportionality. Thus, a two-year-old can say, <coughs> you know, mummy, you know, I formulated a, a good intention. There was an outcome, and I did something good. And proportionately, I should receive my due dessert. And you're not giving it me. You're giving a bigger uh, and disproportional due dessert to my sister or brother, and it's not fair. It's absolutely visceral. It's hardwired into us. In fact, so hardwired into us was there was an exchange between Marx and um, the French socialists in the 1840s, uh, because the French socialists were taking the view that there should be, and they were arguing for a world in which there should be a universal flat rate wage for all. <coughs> no one should get more than anyone else. Uh, rather like universal child benefit. And Marx said, um, but this won't work. If we can't get to a world in which we have from each according to his or her ability to each according to his need. We may get there after 150 years of communism, but actually where we are now is that people expect their deserts. And if you want the able to work and contribute to the whole, and the abler to work and contribute to the whole, you have to acknowledge that in wage dispersion. And he critiqued his fellow socialists for talking about flat earth egalitarianism and not thinking about having some kind of wage dispersion to reflect the fact that the abler thought they deserved innately to get rather more than those who didn't work hard. I mean, this, is, this debate's been going on for, you know, the entire history, if you like, of, of left-wing thought. And um, so I, I, you know, there is, however, a, a very, very, very egalitarian view of fairness, which, which really is all human beings are of equal worth. Uh, we have an obligation to each other. Essentially, it's from each one to his ability to each one to his need. And it's an utterly egalitarian view. It's a, it's a, we're all, every organization is a social organization. Knows every single person puts their shoulder to the wheel. And no single person can honestly say that they're worth more than anyone else. That's one view of fairness. There's another view of fairness, which is, if you like, uh, I call it the libertarian view of fairness, the kind of hunter-gatherer view of fairness, which is, yeah, I, I, the hunter-gatherer, in this Darwinian struggle for survival, leave the cave in the morning with my spear. I'm the best huntsman. When I slay the mammoth and bring it back to the cave, I eat what I kill. I eat as much as I want and I need. And if there's a few morsels left for you, that's only fair. I kill the animal. I took the risk. Without me, there'd be nothing. So be grateful you've got a few morsels. If you like, that's Lloyd Blackfine's approach to fairness. 
I run Goldman Sachs. Uh, nobody could run it better than me. I am absolutely, it's absolutely right that 50% of net revenues after charges should go to me and the, t and, and the teams that generate the revenue because it couldn't go to anyone else. Yes, that means that bonuses can be as high as 20 or 30 million pounds per head, but that's only fair. Because without that, there wouldn't be a business, would there? Two views of fairness, a hunter-gatherer, Darwinian, libertarian view of fairness at this, and an egalitarian view at the other, all masquerading under the rubric of fair. And what I've tried to do in the book um, is to fuse those two traditions and to acknowledge that both have a legitimacy and we all carry around elements of both. Yes, we all do believe, all of us, because we relate intentions to outcomes, that actually a good outcome should be duly rewarded. And we saw that vividly um, recently in two occasions, which, I mean, I'm doing this public sector pay review, uh, and with Mike Elms, the um, primary school headmaster of uh, Tidewell School in South London, who also is trying to revive four or five other primary schools in that orbit, who is being paid with bonuses £200,000 a year. <coughs> The Prime Minister's salary is 142500 and um, the unions went apeshit. Um, you know, an eagle entry interview of fairness. And uh, actually, the right-wing press went apeshit. He was only more than the Prime Minister. A classic example of public sector uh, largesse and ludicrous pay, pay. So everyone went down to, to, to Vox Pop, the mothers, <coughs> waiting at the, at the, at the school gates. Not one, not one, made any criticism of Mike Elm's salary. Nearly all of them said, this man is worth his hire. Many said, he's worth even more. Why? Because he'd done a bloody good job. He turned around these, not just his own school, but the other schools, transforming the life chances of, these, of the children there. Panorama went up to Cleveland. The chief constable made 200,000 pounds, one of the best paid chief constables outside the Met, in the country. It was an outrage this man should make a hundred more than the Prime Minister. And they expected, like the Sun and the Mail, to find lots of citizens of Cleveland who would say how offensive it was, joining the trade union, who would say it was absolutely outrageous. Again, they could, the team couldn't find one single citizen of Cleveland to complain. Why? This man's uh, impact on Cleveland in the few years he's been Chief Constable has been transformatory. You know, the streets are, are walkable, uh, uh, people can do business, uh, people live in their houses without fear. Many of the respondents said, he's not paid enough. This is a man who's due, who has got due dessert. He's used his discretionary efforts and his due desserts are to make 200,000 a year, and that's fair. So you have to accept, actually, that the libertarians, and actually Marx, when he critiqued the egalitarian socialists uh, in the Gotha program, have a point that actually, as human beings, every single one of you um, does carry that notion in your head. And it's not a surprise. That's why every civilization, from you know, the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas through Confucian China, through the European civilizations, always have justice as scales, calibrating uh, at the tariff of punishment and in, by inference reward for actually the, the, the scale of the offense. And that is, you know, that's, what, that's how human beings are. That's how we're hardwired. We do think we're of equal worth, but we also think there is due desert for discretionary effort. But, and this is where I make my, my uh, you know, this is where I think egalitarians have you know, two big points. First, it is, this isn't without limits. You know, you can't pay people 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 times. Even the hunter-gatherer who goes out of his cave um, he recognizes that there was luck involved and he, uh, in, in, in his hunting. He may be unlucky and not come across the mammoths, in which case you rely on his fellow huntsmen um, to be able to share some of their hunt with him if they get lucky and he's unlucky. He requires a, a degree of pooling uh, and thus when he gorges himself on his own kill will make the investment in the team, in the others, by actually leaving much more than just a few morsels. He'll share it. Um, so there's proportionality. And it's this that leads me to the, it's this thinking that leads me to the view that you can bound um, upper limits and lower limits of pay. The upper limit in 
that I've been asked to look in the pair pay review is, a, is 20 to a base of one. A 20 to one is bounded proportionality. Yes, people um, who work hard or take extra responsibility should make more than others, but within this boundary. And the other thing is the role of luck. That we've got to do, a, <coughs> uh, actually, luck plays a huge part in our society. That actually those who are lucky and have not exerted their, uh, uh, their due does ha for, you know, have wealth that isn't the result of their entrepreneurialism, their productiveness, their effort, their working on their talents, um, actually, uh, they should, they have particularly broad shoulders, and we should ask them to pay disproportionately more. Which is why I argue in the book that neoconservatives who say that inheritance tax is a death tax have got it completely wrong. Inheritance tax, properly conceived, is we share in your good luck tax. You did nothing to inherit this two, three, four, five million pounds except draw the lucky. Um, uh, <coughs> lot from the lottery. Um, you, came from, from, you came from particular lines. We don't want all, we don't even want half, but we want a significant part of what you've been left. We share in your good luck, which is why every civilization not only have <coughs> scales, all of them have some kind of levy on the transfer of assets from the rich to the next. Neoconservatives are, in this sense, barbarians, turning their back on uh, the way we uh, uh, live in society and have done since the beginning of time. Similarly, is the National Health Service a socialist service? Well, there are elements of, obviously, you know, um, parts of socialism and its collectivism and, and its sense that every patient has to be treated equally. They're of equal worth. But that isn't actually socialism, in my view. Um, that's actually elementary fairness. There's, I don't know, 200 people in this room. Um, we know that um, about 2% of you, if we could do your genome, will have the pancreatic cancer gene. And we know the women, about 7 8% of you, will have a, a breast cancer gene. And the men, 10% of you, will have the prostate cancer gene. But we don't know, any of us, who's drawn the short straw. What makes sense is for us to recognizing it's just sheer bad luck how this gets dealt out. Sheer bad luck. That we're going to pull together and compensate each other for the possibility of us being the people who were dealt the bad card. The National Health Service is we share in your bad luck service. Which is why Mrs. Thatcher could never privatize it. Now, once you start to push these ideas <coughs> a bit, um, you start to see how radical they are. And I think that, um, uh, <coughs> and I know why Matthew um, enjoyed um, David Cameron's speech yesterday, because he said something substantive. He said um, the, um, the, those with um, broad shoulders should um, uh, disproportionately pay to alleviate disadvantage. And he linked it also to to reviving the great civic institutions that underpin a big society. It was a political statement. You can disagree with it. You can, you can say it was inadequate, but it was a statement. It wasn't about political positioning. It was a political statement. But um, I think if you're going to, if you're, uh, uh, this, um, I think he's playing a dangerous, potentially playing a dangerous game if the Labour Party were clever enough, because they should force the logic of this one of the logics of this, of course, is increased inheritance tax, increased property taxes. What have any of us done and um, who bought our property in the 70s, who 35, 40 years later are sitting on a quarter, maybe half a million, maybe three quarter million pounds of equity through doing absolutely nothing? We baby boomers arrive at 60 years old, rather wealthy, and it's not through um, any desert. It's utterly undeserving. Maybe, we, maybe the mansion tax that both Vince Cable and uh, David Miliband proposed would be utterly fair in that context. You start to open up a really sweet, we could really generate asset-based welfare um, to support the disadvantaged by actually you know, saying to those who didn't deserve their wealth, you should pay into a common pool and we should transfer that wealth to the people at the bottom of the pile. But also, um, it makes fundamental points about capitalism. See, I think that um, we're unlikely any time soon to socialize capitalism. 
So the big question is, how do you do good capitalism rather than bad capitalism? Now, good capitalism is about you know, well-owned companies stewarding their assets and their people, innovating their way entrepreneurially to get their due desserts in open and competitive markets. That is a good capitalism, and, you can, and it does deliver the goods. We know that because um, one of the reasons that wealth took off over the last couple of hundred years, in my, you know, as I argue in the book, is that the great institutions of the Enlightenment held capitalism to account, opened up societies, and actually permitted entrepreneurs, the great inventors, to get their due dessert for their innovativeness in a way that hadn't been true before when it was all about the crown or the Catholic church, wherever it might be. Um, so you, we know from history that that is what delivers the goods. Bad capitalism is about poorly owned companies rigging markets with endemic conflicts of interest, trying to capture economic rent, not being innovative, and, fend, and using the political system to fend off challenges or any disturbance of their privileges. And we've watched bad capitalism in action big time in the last 20 years. Bad capitalism delivered the financial crisis. Bad capitalism delivered banks being able to grow their assets to, in Britain's case, five times GDP with assets that they were declaring were, were less risky but were indeed more risky with less capital underpinning it, leading to <clears throat> what would have been without the intervention of taxpayers writing a check for £1.3 trillion a bank collapse, a slump, an unemployment in a country going to more than 10 million. That's unfair capitalism run riot. And indulged by a political class, indulged by new labor, indulged by um, uh, in particular um, the prime, then Prime Minister and Gordon Brown, um, who thought they were being clever because it delivered an economy that seemed to be delivering the golden egg of rising tax revenues in which they could deliver on improved public services. But in fact, they were involved in a Mephistophelian bargain, turning a blind eye as Labour Party people with Labour Party values to um, profound unfairnesses in front of their damn eyes. And the consequences we're all living through. We have uh, the biggest budget deficit in peacetime, which needs to be lowered more slowly and more rationally than the, than the um, coalition is planning, but it has to be lowered. A profoundly unbalanced <coughs> economy that has to be changed. We ha have as a country to work for our living but to think about how we invest, how we innovate um, in a way we have not done for 30 years. We simply lack the structures and systems to do it. We have to think what they will be. Uh, we have to think about what constitutes good ownership and not just think that anybody owning anything, chasing a dime, produces great results, the neoconservative proposition. As Jack Welsh said, who um, uh, declared himself in favor of shareholder value, it's, it's stupid. And we have to recognize that uh, it's whole societies that innovate. It's whole societies that take risks. It's whole societies that have to look after each other in a very fast-changing world. Um, the population of productive entrepreneurs we need to come forward and build the great businesses of the future that deliver jobs can't be recruited from uh, the cohort of people leaving our top 100 private schools. It's just mad. Um, we, we need um, those people with their grotesque wealth to uh, put their hand in their pocket for the common good. We need to construct schools, hospitals, you know, that, act, uh, that actually serve the commonality. And we have to ensure that great swathes of people at the bottom of our society have opportunity, um, because it's only fair. And this is about our political system to permit these views to be expressed, about a media system which itself is proportional rather than disproportional in the way that it covers and, uh, news and shocking events. When I, I agree that Baby P and Harry and Gay, and I agree uh, the Chauvin twins being murdered were absolutely unbelievable, disgraceful. But the atmosphere in which it was discussed made the Salem witch trials look rational. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the result has been that actually n um, nobody is gonna, uh, of any quality can be recruited to either run Harry and Gay or its social services department. And the people there are just about keeping their head above water, terrified that actually the next media storm will um, you know, catastrophize, cat catastrophize their lives and careers in the way it did their predecessors. You know, fairness is about moving across a really, really broad front. It's not just about asking um, high-rate taxpayers 
um, to give up their child benefit um, for the disadvantaged moving into work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you uh, two or three questions really quickly and ask you to respond to them quickly because I know the audience want to get in and otherwise I become very unpopular and I get lots of emails saying, why do you dominate the Q&A? So, uh, so um, the, the first one is just, I, I'm really fascinated. We do a lot of work here at the RSA on this. Uh, as part of our 21st century enlightenment mission, look, looking at the relationship between research on human nature, human evolution, uh, human physiology, and contemporary <coughs> issues and challenges. I, I, I'm interested, you play into this debate, which is very, very lively, as you say, about evolution, and there's been certainly a shift in the last few years towards those who argue for group selection and the importance of collaboration, as against those who argued for a kind of uh, you know, yeah, kind of yeah, a yeah. neo-Darwinian kind of view of the world. It's also, however, the case, as you know from behavioral economics, that we're profoundly idiosyncratic in our kind of judgments. If you look at you know, the work that philosophers do on the trolley game, for example. So how important is it, in terms of the judgments we ought to make about political philosophy now, what our predispositions as a species are? <laughs> um... You could do it without that. I mean, I could have written the book without that being the pre, without underpinning it. Um, I thought it gave it extra spice, um, and I, it was a world I knew nothing about. And I thought, here I am writing a book about the British economy, and the first the chapters two and three are about moral philosophy and behavioral psychology. I thought, and I was, says that. But I do, I mean, I, I actually think one has to have some kind of view of um, human nature. I mean, the, the classic position on the right is that you know, men and women are fallen, um, and so you have to work with the fact that human nature is kind of malevolent, uh, and on the left of you that actually, um, basically, men and women are good if the wider circumstances permit their goodness to be expressed. Um, and I, I, you know, I wanted to say um, um, something slightly different from that, and which is that we are social animals. I think that you've talked about behavioral e economics. I mean, one of the insights of behavioral economics is that um, we, we, <laughs> we're not terribly you know, rational, um, but our, what, then the irrationality derives from our social nature as beings. I mean, we prefer the now rather than the, than the future. Um, we prefer, we will follow the herd, we will follow the crowd. So that, you know, um, so the place I've got to is not to get into the you know, good-bad debate between traditional left and right. The place I've tried to get to with this book is to say, you know, basically, people are fair-minded. And they, the, the job is to devise social structures that, to permit them to be more fair-minded and to support fair-mindedness. Um, is, uh, is, is this about the relationship between the concept of fairness and the concept of naturalness? So there's, in a sense, people's account of what's fair based upon some notion of what is natural. Is that, I mean, that's the impl implication of, of, of saying that, this, that our human nature is relevant to the, 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 the political philosophy we ought to adopt. Well, I think that, I think that, um, I think it is important uh, to, I mean, I think thinking about the National Health Service or about inheritance tax and the way I've characterized it. Um, uh, I mean, again, I'm, I mean, I'm not quite occupying the same kind of categories as you're occupying, because I, you know, I've due to the of luck. So I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever your view of human nature, um, actually, as I navigate, as I'm the author of my life, you know, I'm enormously aware of the role of good and bad luck in the positions in which I find myself, and I differentiate between luck I make myself and luck that just happened to me. And I find that quite a helpful way of thinking about what's happened to myself. Although, of course, and, of, and, to, and to and to and to you know, even to you, Matthew. I know you know we know each other well. I mean, you know. So, I, I my invitation to you is not to drop those categories, but to add to the categories you've got. I mean, you know, play around with luck well, and bad. I, I suppose the point I'm kind of driving at well is that uh, uh, ninety percent of people think they're above average drivers. Um, uh, so we systematically, well, in, what is interesting, we like overestimate ourselves, yeah. we systematically overestimate ourselves. Uh, so um, this kind of human nature is problematic in terms of this distinction between luck and talent. 
Because generally speaking, that which we are good at, we call talent, and that which other people are better at us than uh, at, we call luck. I mean, that's, look, <laughs> this is not this is not a kind of just a kind of uh, a throwaway comment. It's true. I mean, it is, is generally speaking the case. So anyway, uh, let me ask a second no, question. I know, I know, I'm, I'm not, just so I'm not sure that's time. I'd like to have a show of hands on the audience here. See, I'm not These are sure. not normal people. These are all philosopher kings. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, the philosopher kings in the RSA would be quite interesting to see what the, what the audience think about this, because I'm not sure that uh, I do think you're right about the overestimation, but I don't think um, that I regard you know, um, your talent as luck. Um, I mean, who if I see a great concert pianist or a great mathematician or a great writer, I don't think they got lucky. I rather admire their talent. And I think it's due to a fast runner, a great, a great footballer, a great musician. I mean, whoever it might be, I'm not kind of. I don't say, well, they just got lucky. But you know, Polly, I think. But, they ha I think. Ha I mean, I think they. I think they have genuine talent. But in Polly, think, um, Polly Toynbee and David Walker's book last year, one of the things they did was they did focus groups amongst rich people, in which rich people systematically failed to understand where they were in the income distribution. So all I'm all I'm saying to you is that is that your argument, uh, part of the problem of the appeal of your argument, is that wherever people are, they will tend to think. <laughs> They're just a little bit above average, even if they're miles above average, and they will tend to think that they deserve it more than they more than they do. So, in a way, oh, our, our, our human nature makes it difficult for us to 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 to, to personalise the kind of philosophy as well. But let, uh, I want to ask you something quick. To, to, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, let me okay. ask you something. That's good. I'll, I'll, just that we can. That we, yeah, no, you and I could go on a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we will. Certainly we will. Could, <laughs> we certainly could. Can I just ask you one other question before we open up? What was very interesting about David Cameron's speech yesterday was this clear attempt to say that demarcation in British politics is not between fairness and unfairness, it's between statism and non-statism. I'm interested in your kind of reflection on that. I mean, it, it feels to me like an extremely clever argument. I mean, one that has also opens up all sorts of issues. But from your perspective, in relation to the argument about fairness, how does the statism, non-statism issue play into the fairness debate? Is it possible, is it credible to be an, a non, an, is it credible to be a enthusiastic champion of social justice but skeptical about the state? No, you have to be, you can be skeptical about um, the efficiency of particular state institutions, but you cannot be skeptical about the necessity of having the state to um, stand as the umpire referee and ultimately the, you know, the creator of the rules by which fairness is generated. You simply have to have the state. Um, now, you know, the question then is, is, is the good society about, um, you know, the state <coughs> doing all of that or being an umpire referee enabler? And as we know those arguments where you and I shoulder to shoulder. And I would, I mean, I do think Britain needs a denser array of civic institutions than it possesses. Um, I do think that whether, you, you know, the kind of clone high street and the, the kind of weakness of everything from kind of Boy Scout and Girls Guide groups, you know, through the, you know, the diminution of the local library, not compensated for by the rise of social networking sites, is a problem. And I think that, you know, they, that Cameron's right to say that he um, wants to try and plug it with his big society program. But I th heard his speech slightly differently from you. I mean, he didn't say, uh, as I heard it, in fact, explicitly says, not that there should be no state, but actually, you know, it's a, it's a, new, a new role for the state in triggering the big society. Um, not the withdrawal of the state, but a cleverer, more adept state. And I found that, you know, I, I found that a statement of his one nation, Toryism, that I, you know, I thought, well, it's certainly better than Thatcherism.